Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College, along with my co-host, nursing student, um, Joseph Torino. And today we're talking about a way to achieve better health and a healthier body. Our guest today is Michael Matthews. He is the author of two books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Leaner, Stronger, and a cookbook called The Shredded Chef. He has helped thousands of people achieve their health and fitness goals. Michael, welcome to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was very interested about this interview. I've actually believe I've read your book before. I was just interested in like your background and how you first became interested in building a better body and physical fitness and like you know what's your typical gym workout like from that yeah i got into weightlifting i was 17 or 18 so i grew up playing sports played a bit of baseball and then i got into hockey and played quite a bit of hockey and when that came to an end i wanted to keep doing something uh with my body and i chose weightlifting just kind of randomly it just seemed like something interesting something i hadn't really done much of in in my hockey most of the training for hockey was was specific to the sport and so i gathered up some friends and we just got some bodybuilding magazines and then just went at it and and had fun and enjoyed it and you know because your body's very responsive to resistance training in the beginning if you do things even halfway right you're gonna you're gonna do pretty well for the first six months or so and so that's encouraging so you know we were just we didn't know really what we were doing but knew that we didn't really know we were just kind of reading some stuff in magazines trying it seeing what happens and um i found that i just liked the routine i liked how um of course the changes in my body but also i just liked how i felt after working out and it seemed to have other benefits um, so I just st- stuck with it. And I did that for some time. And then along the way, decided to actually educate myself. Uh, because for years, I just did different workouts and I'd worked with some trainers. And I would say, in a sense, I didn't take it too seriously. It was just something that I did. I looked at it maybe a bit more as exercise versus training. So exercise, okay. the, the key difference there being training is more systematic. It's mm-hmm. more working towards specific goals, mm-hmm. um, using a more codified type of uh, approach, whereas exercise is mostly just moving your body and burning calories. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe you are, regardless of whether you're doing some resistance training or maybe it's just cardiovascular, you're not necessarily tracking, uh, your information and making sure that you're improving over time. And so I started to make that transition from a more of an exercise approach to a training approach. Uh, I would say it's probably about five years ago or so now and was um, surprised the to, to see the differences in my body mm-hmm. and how even though I've been weightlifting for many years um, it's just I was I was gain, finally gaining strength again gaining muscle again and on the diet side of things I, I educated myself um, and really that comes down to the fundamentals of understanding the metabolism which is is pretty much taped at this point scientifically speaking um, you know, there's a we have a century of metabolic research that to, that we can look to now, and we know um, we know how the metabolism works, and we know what it takes to reduce body weight, to reduce body fat percentage in all people under all circumstances. Now, of course, there are some medical conditions that make things a bit more complicated, and there are some um, individual variances in terms of preferences and. Uh, how how well people can comply based on what they're eating or not eating or whatever, but um, we we know that the under uh, the underlying principles we know how the metabolism works, and so that was a matter of just um, learning about that and just putting it into practice, and so learning about how energy in versus energy out actually works, and learning about how it's not only about how many calories you're eating and you're burning, it's also about where those calories are coming from in terms of protein, carbohydrate, and fat and learning about the importance of food choice 
because because of the I mean really that that's 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 where nutrition comes in and how that affects things. And so again, it was just a process of learning things and, and trying them and seeing how it goes. And um, along the way, I was started helping other people I know because they were just seeing a difference in my body and asking, mm-hmm. hey, what are you doing? And so sometimes I would invite, you know, hey, just come to the gym and I'll show you my program. Here's what I'm doing. It's uh, it's, it's very much like a strength training program. We're going to be working with barbells. We're going to be working with some heavier mm-hmm. weights. We're not going to be doing two-hour workouts. They're going to be a bit shorter. Okay. Um, there's going to be longer rest times, things that were kind of counterintuitive. And um, so that then turned into, hey, I should write a book on this. And I should write a book. I just want I want the book that somebody I wish somebody would have just given me back when I was 17 and said, hey, read this, do these things and you'll get uh, like this is really all that you need. And that's now what this new third edition is. And that was my intention really from the beginning. And I've iterated on this book, you know, over the course of years based mostly on reader feedback and reader okay. suggestions, which has been great. And um, yeah, so that's the that's the. Long story, maybe not so short, but. (laughs) So your body went through, uh, I would say, a major transformation uh, based upon what you're saying, would you say? Um, To one that uh, the workout was, um, I guess, more working out. Now it's more targeted to build Mm -hmm. muscle rather than just work out. Exactly. Would you you agree with that? So tell me. Yeah, yeah. uh, I mean, I like to look at that as you use your, your workouts. So you take your time, right? And I like to I tell people, let's, let's put, most people have three to five hours a week to give to exercise. And I'm just saying that based on having worked now with thousands of people. And so I say, put 80% of that time into training your muscles. And we do that to gain muscle and strength. We don't do that to burn fat necessarily, although you burn some. We don't do that just to burn calories. And then we use the diet to reduce fat levels to where you want them to be and then stabilize them. So, I'm go- Mike, I'm going to ask you specific questions because I think mm-hmm. um, we really want to know how to look like you. Okay? <laughs> All right. So, would you say that um, there is a specific or appropriate time to build muscle during the day? Yeah, no, not really. There's a bit of research that shows in men in particular, testosterone levels tend to be a bit higher in the afternoon. So, if you really wanted to micromanage, you know, that's probably more relevant to somebody who's really going for it in terms of bodybuilding maybe someone who's a competitor or an amateur trying to make make the uh make the the grade and or people who are training maybe twice a day but for most of us and myself included i work out first thing in the morning because i find there are several reasons why i like it one it's a great way to start the day so you you know you just get momentum because you've you've by the time i'm stepping into the office i've already i've already finished a workout I'm, i'm really awake and i feel good and there's research that shows that, and this is one of those things that we don't really need science to tell us this because we've all experienced it, that the mood, our mood in the morning tends to color the rest of our days. So if we can do something to put ourselves in a good mood in the morning, we're going we're gonna to benefit from that for the rest of the day. And so um, I also like that it's just done because some days I, I'm working fairly late. And if I'm getting out of the office at seven or eight o'clock, one, I may not want to go to the gym at that time. Two, if I do go, it may not be a great workout because I've, you know, I just, um, a lot of my work is, is just mental work, but that actually affects physical performance. That's been shown in research as well, that if you do a lot of mental work and you feel a bit mentally fatigued and you go in to do a workout, it's going to be worse than if you did that workout without the mental fatigue. And then I also have, uh, I have two kids. And so I don't think my wife would be too happy if I'm like at the gym working out at night while she's trying to put two kids to bed. So those are all my reasons for working out early. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC. My name is Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And I'm here along with my co-host, Joseph Torino. And today we're talking to Michael Matthews, author of two books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner stronger and cookbook author also the shredded chef so mike you talk about that how much cardiovascular versus weightlifting should we be doing if you have a lot of time to be spending exercising you could do a bit more than this but for most people again if you have three to five hours a week that you can give to exercise that's great you can reap more or less all of its health benefits and its body composition benefits and um, with that being the assumption, I'd say 80% of that time go, should be put into training your muscles, and then 20% of that time can be put into doing cardio. 
And we, there are a couple reasons for that. One is training your muscles is going to benefit your body composition the most. And by body composition, I mean, what is your weight made up of? And really what we're focusing on, of course, is muscle and fat. And let's, let's take a, let's break that down first into the aesthetic side of things. So we all want to look a certain way. Some people may want to look a little bit more muscular than others, but we all want to look fit. We all want to look athletic. And to, to do that, you actually, even as, as a woman, you have to gain a fair amount of muscle. So I've worked with thousands and thousands of women now, just everyday women who want to look fit and athletic and lean and have muscle definition. They don't want to look necessarily like a bodybuilder. And for that, uh, it requires 10 to 15 pounds of muscle gain uh, and then getting their body fat percentage down into, let's say, around 20%. That tends to be the sweet spot for most women. And to gain that 10 or 15 pounds of muscle, that could be a year to a year and a half of wow. consistent mm-hmm. weightlifting for the average woman. And for a, for a guy, I would say uh, the, the look that most guys want, which is not the necessarily the super muscle-bound meathead look, but yeah. maybe more something like you see in the superhero movies, right? right. Yep. Um, that's that's probably 30 pounds of muscle that they have to gain uh, in all in the right places. And that's, that's probably two years of work for the average guy. And so, so there's a lot of work to, that needs to be done to get to the look. Mm. And then, of course, it can be maintained a lot easier than, you know, you mm-hmm. could maintain those bodies on a couple hours a week if you really wanted to. But getting there requires a lot more work. And then there's the health side of things. I mean, there's more and more research coming out showing that weightlifting, well, it could be any sort of resistance training, that gaining muscle and strength is very, very healthy. It was once thought, for example, that uh, resistance training was bad for your heart. We know that's not true now. And that was, you know, because at that time it was like, oh, well, okay, if you're going to do resistance training, you're actually harming your heart health a little bit. So you have to do cardiovascular training to counterbalance that. And we know it's not true. Uh, Resistance training improves heart health. And cardiovascular training does uh, probably offer a a bit more uh, in the way of heart health that you're so you're not going to get maybe necessarily everything you could get out of exercise if you only did as far as heart health goes, which is, of course, should be top on all of our lists because heart disease is the number one killer out there. And so you can add the, the cardiovascular uh, to further improve your heart health. And, and also it helps, it burns energy. So that means that ultimately you get to eat more food, which is nice. And many people enjoy it. So that's a reason to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I personally don't like running, for example, but I do enjoy biking. So um, that's that's great. And the, the, the problem though with how many people exercise is they have those, they have the 80, 20 reverse. So they'll, they'll spend most of their time like on a treadmill or an elliptical or whatever. And then they'll do very little strength training. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Training. So you should, you thinking that we should reverse that and do 80% of the weight resistance, um, or resistance training and then do the, the, uh, 20% of cardiovascular. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and cause if you, if you reverse that, it's good. It's good that people are exercising. Um, that's great. It's of course way better than being sedentary. However, again, if we're looking at really getting the most out of the time that we have, mm-hmm. The, the the problem with cardio is it really doesn't benefit your body composition all that much. It right. does help. It helps with lower fat levels right. if you know what you're doing with your diet, and it, and it's good for your body and it's it's healthy. But it doesn't it doesn't help you build or preserve muscle. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the one of the things I talk about this in the books and I write about it and I, I kind of work it into my my ongoing work regularly as I, as I want people to think with a lifestyle. I want people to think with all of this as something that they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives. And so if you look into our later years, we want to make sure that we're strong. We want to be strong 70 year olds. And there are a number of reasons for that. One, the, the amount of lean mass that you have, just the total lean mass is directly correlated with all cause mortality. So the more muscular we are as we get older, the less likely we are to die from all causes. And there are a number of reasons for that, but that's just the simple fact of the matter. And then there's also the fact that if we're strong in our later years, we're not going to be falling down and breaking our hips. We're going to be able to stay active. We're going to be able to enjoy our lives a lot more, be active with our grandkids and so forth. And so there's also that major benefit. There's the immediate benefit of we get to look better right now and we get to feel better and we have better health. But then as we get older, uh, future us is going to is going to thank uh 
present us for the work that we're putting in. And cardiovascular, for all of its benefits, uh, cardiovascular training doesn't do that for us. It doesn't make us stronger. It doesn't increase uh, the amount of lean mass on our bodies. And in fact, the way that many people do it, it actually causes muscle, it just accelerates muscle loss over time, which happens naturally as we age if we don't do something about it. And doing something about it means training our muscles. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with my student nursing co-host, Joseph Torino. And today we're talking to Michael Matthews, author of two books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Leaner Stronger and a cookbook author, The Shredded Chef. You were talking about lean muscle and the benefits of building muscle as opposed to really focusing on a very high cardiovascular exercise regimen. And you said most often it's diet what controls the fat on your body. How important are your diet plan choices for losing weight? So the first and most important thing that you have to get right with diet, regardless of whatever's on your plan, when we, you know, when you drill down into the foods you're eating and when you're eating them, that those mm-hmm. those things are actually a lot less important than people think as oh. far as body weight and body fat goes. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that needs to be understood is is something called energy balance. It's a scientific term, but it's a simple term, and it's simply the relationship between the amount of energy that you're eating and the amount of energy that you're burning. Mm-hmm. And this, these things are generally measured in calories when we're talking about food, and a calorie is, is really just a measurement of energy. So one calorie is the amount of energy that it takes to heat one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. So that's the technical definition. And of course, then food contains potential energy. So we eat it and our body is able to digest it, break it down and, and derive energy from it. And as body fat is really just a, it's a, think of it as an energy store. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what our bodies do every day is we eat food and then it starts uh, using the energy available from, from the food to run everything in the body. Because of course it costs energy every second of every day to stay alive. And then it stores a bit of the excess energy from the food because food contains, it's, it's quite energy dense and it doesn't require uh, all that much energy compared to what's in food to just stay alive from moment to moment. So a bit of the excess energy from all the food that we just ate in maybe five minutes is stored as body fat. Eventually the energy in the food runs out and then our bodies, if our bodies at that point didn't have a way to get more energy, we would simply die. All everything would just shut down. Or yeah. so what that would mean is that we'd have to just keep eating food all day, and we have to like carefully micromanage our food. Now, fortunately, we have body fat, and that's what body fat is for. So in that case, what happens is the body then starts uh, dipping into its body fat stores, waiting for its next meal. And so our bodies then kind of go into this fat storage and fat loss mode every day. Uh, in and out of base, just a based when we eat. When we're eating, it's fat storage mode. You could think of it that way, regardless of what you're eating, regardless of its fat or carbs or protein. Those are stored a bit differently, but you can just think about it that way to keep it simple. Mm-hmm. And then when after our body has finished processing the food, no more food energy available, it goes into fat burning mode. And so what you have to do is to reduce your body fat stores, you have to eat less calories than you've burned over a period of time because mm-hmm. that deficit, that difference, most of that will have been obtained from your body fat. So let's just say, let's look at it in the course of a week. Let's just say in a week you burned 20,000 calories. Let's mm-hmm. just say, right? That's the amount of energy you burned and that energy is burned via the, the basic processes that it stay, that it, your body um, does to stay alive. So that's basal metabolic rate. If you just sat there and did nothing, it still costs energy to stay alive. Plus the physical activities that you do, those cost energy, plus even the digestion and the absorption of food costs a bit of energy. So you add all that up, 20,000 calories at the end of the week, but you only ate 15,000 calories. So there's a 5,000 calorie difference between the burning and the, and the eating. Most of that difference will have come from body fat. Your body does have other things it can do. It can start eating away muscle for energy as well, but it doesn't want to because the body knows how important muscle is because there's a point where if you lose enough muscle, 
you simply have a heart attack and die. You can see that in research with AIDS patients, for example, or different muscle wasting diseases. So the body really wants to preserve its muscle and its fat is there for this purpose. So that's the first key thing that you have to understand is if you are not creating that energy deficit over time, it doesn't matter what foods you eat, it doesn't matter when you eat, you will not lose fat. And if you do, then you will lose fat. And that's true regardless of uh, what foods you're eating. I mean, a good mm-hmm. example of that is um, he, he's a Kansas State University professor, at least he was at the time of when this story was making the rounds. His name is Mark Haub. And just to prove this point uh, that, that I just made, he, for 10 weeks, he ate like Hostess cupcakes, Doritos, Oreos and protein shakes. I think that was like, that was literally his diet. He was on the cupcake, Dorito, Oreo protein shake diet. And in 10 weeks, he lost 27 pounds because he carefully managed his energy balance. And he also improved many of his health biomarkers, which just goes to show how healthy it is to just bring your weight into a, into a healthy range. And I, and I cite a couple other examples in the book of uh, there was a science teacher who lost 56 pounds in six months eating nothing but McDonald's. Uh-huh. And so it's not that you should do these things. <laughs> it's not that nutrition doesn't matter, but you have to first get that right because nothing else matters if yeah. you don't. You're listening to Your Family's Health in the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And I'm here with student nursing student co-host Joseph Torino. And today we're talking to Michael Matthews, author of two books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, and author of cookbook, The Shredded Chef. So are we counting calories are we are we actually saying okay today i need to consume a thousand calories um 800 of which should be mostly chicken and protein are, are we doing are that are the way that methodical that's a it depends kind of answer which i generally i don't like but let me explain um so if you want to guarantee results and you want to make sure that you make no mistakes, then it's smart to either count calories or to plan them out beforehand, which is what I talk about in the book. Um, I, I actually personally still prefer following a meal plan where mm-hmm. cause what it allows you to do is you get to sit down. And fortunately, uh, I, there, it's very rare that I would recommend somebody eat a thousand calories. That'd have to be a very small person mm-hmm. who is already probably fairly lean and not very active. Yeah, I just use that number as a... Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I know, but the reason, I mean, it's it's good, I just wanted to make that point because there are a lot of women in particular out there who get bad advice that really what it comes down to is like starvation dieting or crash dieting. And if you're eating 800 calories a day, that you're not going to, you're not going to have a good time of it. Um, But so fortunately, one, you'd be able to eat more food than that. And two, you'd be able to eat the foods that you like. And that's where meal planning comes in, where it's actually, and I'm, I'm, again, speaking how having worked with thousands and thousands of people, most people find that it's not hard to follow a meal plan. And even in some, in some cases, eat the same foods every meal, every day for a month or two, because they're eating stuff that they like. And for people who like a bit more variety, what they often do is they just make some options. They go, okay, here's here's breakfast uh, ABC, and I just pick, you know, whatever I'm in the mood for. If I want A, mm-hmm. I do A. And the numbers in terms of calories and protein, carbs, and fat are more or less the same. Mm-hmm. And then eventually maybe they get sick of those and they make a new one. But again, what most people find is when you're not restricted, you know, I'm not telling you you can't eat carbs or you can't eat sugar or you can't eat something else that you like. Of course, some foods are more conducive to weight loss than others. Like if you're like, all I like is pizza and hamburgers. All right, it's going to be tough. You can do it, mm-hmm. but you're going to you're going to you're going to go hungry because those foods are are very calorie dense and not filling enough to where, you know, you, you, you can't just eat some pizza and then go for seven hours and not get hungry. So that's why some foods like, for example, fruit and vegetables can be great because they fill you up, but they don't contain many calories. And then you work in some carbs that you like. Maybe you want to work in a treat, uh, you know, take sugar, for example. Yes, you can eat some sugar every day. You can be healthy. You can lose weight. Of course, there's a point where it can be a problem. If you want to eat 50 grams of sugar a day, no, that's just a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you want to have 
10 or 15 grams of sugar as a little dessert every day. If you do that, but you also get the majority of your calories from relatively unprocessed, nutritious foods, you can do quite well. Or you can do it a bit more intuitively. You can, of course, of course you can lose weight uh, without counting calories. However, no matter what you do, you have to make sure that you're creating that energy deficit. And so that's where some people, they it almost forces you to eat a bit more restrictively because some foods, they're very palatable. They contain quite a few calories. It's hard to know exactly how much you're eating. And so then that's where you do have to kind of get into a situation where you're like, all right, I'm just going to be eating these vegetables and I'm going to eat maybe one fifth size of uh, grains per day. And you can do that. Um, it's just, it's actually more difficult in some ways and often less enjoyable than being more methodical because right. by being more methodical, you end every day knowing that you lost a little bit of fat. You can't see how much you lost because maybe you lost 50 grams of fat that day in terms of weight. You're not going to see that because it was mm -hmm. taken all over your body, but you know because you stuck to your meal plan and you know that it's laid out correctly and you did your workouts, you lost a little bit of fat and that's, okay. that's encouraging. Do you find that it's difficult for patients to lose fat while they're trying to build muscle because I know for building muscle you're going to have to have a fair amount of protein to build up that muscle from hypertrophy but at the same time you have to eat less calories does that change the balance at all in your macronutrients not so much in macronutrients the key thing to understand there is if you are new to resistance training or if maybe you've been doing resistance training for a while but not really doing it and uh, not doing it maybe the way that I discuss in the book um, and not really pushing yourself to get stronger, then you can build muscle and lose fat at the same time. And how that really works is in, in terms of your diet, you just set your diet up for fat loss. So you create that energy deficit. It's going to be a high mm -hmm. protein diet because that is just better in every way, especially when you're wanting to to lose weight and it can be moderate carb moderate fat or even moderately higher carb and moderate and a little bit lower fat is where I recommend most people start because they're going to enjoy it the most and they're going to find it the easiest to comply with and you set your diet up for fat loss and then you just get into the gym and work your muscles and push yourself to get stronger and progress and you will just gain muscle and, and get stronger however when you're what what is called the newbie gains phase, the honeymoon mm, phase yeah. where your body is hyper responsive, once that ends, it becomes very hard to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time because one of the downsides of being in an energy deficit is it impairs hypertrophy. It impairs mm. your body's muscle building machinery, so to speak. And that's really just because there's um, when your body is in an energy deficit, it's mild starvation. That's what we're talking about. It maybe doesn't feel that way to you because when you do it right, you're not suffering. You're not really hungry. You're not dealing with cravings. But as far as your body's concerned, it knows that if this continues too long, uh, it's going to have some big problems. You can't you can't starve it. You can't you can't keep it in an energy deficit forever, right? And so the body has different countermeasures to try to erase the deficit, and it also employs a an energy triage of sorts where it starts prioritizing what it is willing to allot energy to. And muscle building is not very high on the list. So what happens is muscle building takes a hit. And then what happens, so when you're that intermediate, you know, now you're, you're no, you, you no longer are, are, are benefiting from yeah. newbie gains, yeah. you basically have to choose yes. between, do I want to lose fat now or do I want to gain muscle? Mm -hmm. And do you, you, you have to, to gain muscle effectively and efficiently, you want to do the opposite of what you're doing with fat loss. You actually want to make sure that you are in a slight calorie surplus over time. You want to give your body a bit more energy right. than it needs because then what that tells it is food is plentiful. We don't have to worry about starving to death. So we're going to we're going to raise uh, we're going to we're going to put muscle building back up on the list here and we're going to we're going to give it all the energy that it needs. Well, thank you, Mike, so much for such a packed interview with information. We're going to have to have you back bigger, leaner, stronger and thinner, leaner, stronger and cookbook of Shredded Chef. This is Dr. Janine Cookrod from the nursing department here at NASA Community College, along with nursing student co-host Joseph Torino. And we want to thank you, the listening audience, for tuning into this week's edition of your family's health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. 
This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.